everyone, and welcome back to Hate Read. I'm Em. And I'm Anna. And every fortnight, one of us challenges the other to read a book that we are sure they will hate. Uh, this last fortnight, or a little bit longer, we've, we've been on a recording hiatus, um, I challenged Em to read Honeymoon by James Patterson. And Howard Ruffin. Oh, yes, and Howard Ruffin, which... I didn't really know enough about James Patterson's work to recognize what parts were written by him and which were not. So really, it didn't have any I effect on me. I would suspect probably all of it was written by Howard yeah. Ruffin. Would be my and James Patterson was just there to sell it. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's how it works at this point. I don't know how how long into the James Patterson um, empire this was. I know this was written in 2005. Mm-hmm. I don't really know when James Patterson started outsourcing all of his shit to other people. But, um, yeah, I, I would suspect he didn't really have too much to do with this, but who knows? Yeah, there was a lot of, and I'm sure we will talk about this soon, but a lot of just like very amateur writing, I felt Mm. like in this book, Mm. which I don't know if that's fair to say as someone who has never written her own book before, but (laughs) I mean, (laughs) I read a lot of them. Okay. So, (laughs) First questions first, Em. Did you actually finish this wonderful novel? I did. Um, Yay. It was an adventure. From, well, here's the thing. There were a lot of twists in this book. And this is my main complaint oh. about this book. There were a lot of twists in this book. But most of those twists were not really twists. It was just the author choosing not to tell us something that yes. the characters already knew. It was so fucking annoying. It was trying it was so, so annoying. hard to be mysterious. I'm like, yes. you're not. You're, I read the back of the book. I know what it's about. Yes. Don't wait until 30% of the way through to reveal something about your well, even, main character. Even more than that, like there would be characters with code names or whatever, and they yes. were oh characters God. that we already knew. And then like 20 chapters later, it'd be like, oh, the tourist who was so-and-so. Like, oh, cool. So it's not really a twist. You just didn't tell us that information. Yeah, like, you were trying to be mysterious about something that wasn't mysterious or even made sense in the context of this novel whatsoever. <laughs> like, I did not right. understand that I entire storyline. Maybe and I'm the dummy. I don't know. Maybe, that's what I thought, too. I was like, <laughs> am I stupid? Because, like, this is... This is a, I I mean, like, that's kind of the perception of James Patterson novels, right? Is that Mm -hmm. they are widely accessible to basically anyone in an airport who might need something to read, right? Mm -hmm. Like, Mm -hmm. so I'm like, this can't actually be complicated. It can't be that I'm missing something. Like, it can't be that I'm, but. It can't be me. (laughs) Like, I feel like it can't be me, but at the same time, it's like, I'm not getting it. And this is supposed to be something that literally everyone can get. So maybe I am the (laughs) stupid one. I don't know. Yeah, I don't, well, I don't know which is worse is to not be able to understand the plot or like be totally and and be aware of that fact or like to be totally mystified and surprised and in love with it. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. (laughs) Which is worse. I don't know. (laughs) Sorry if you really like James Patterson. So it starts out with like a prologue, you know, one of those really annoying prologues where it's something that happens later on in the novel a big dramatic scene and they're going to show it to us now so that so that we're like into it um get hyped. so it's some character who is having stomach problems and believes that they are dying because they feel like the insides of their stomach are being burned away mm-hmm. um and they're in the bathroom and the they're like throwing up and there's someone knocking on the door and the chapter the little i guess it's a chapter ends with them saying like oh I don't know what killed me but I know who did it and then it goes into the book proper yes from there. which we never really are certain who that character is that's speaking at the beginning which I'm no I'm pretty sure maybe it was first per- was it was it the detective yeah because of the O'Hara? the it's in first person the knocking on the the door because I think oh I think that's the only time that that really happens where? So I was thinking it was the first victim. Oh, okay. Well, maybe. I don't know. I don't know. Because it's never... Like, it's... We're never given this scene again in this exact context. Yeah. Yeah. Which is what you usually do when you have one of these flash forwards is, like, you're very specific about it. Right. And then when you return to it later, you're like, ah, yes, I recognize this. I but. think there were... Like, because I'm looking back over it now, and I think there were certain details, like the fact that they... um. Because he hits his head, and that comes back later. 
Because mm-hmm. she says, like, oh, I don't think he even noticed that he hit his head. Mm, so okay. I think I think it's the main character is mm. who this is supposed to be. Okay. okay. So <laughs> I think. Well, they, but it's confusing. <laughs> I <laughs> My favorite part about this this first intro chapter was that the character claimed that they could feel the pain everywhere including their fingernails. Just like Yeah, mm. that was I don't know. Like I'm like I feel like that could have been a good description in like a better book where it's like, "Oh, it's so all-consuming that they feel it even in places where you can't feel things." Uh-huh. But because the rest of this book is so bad, I kind of feel like they just don't know how fingernails work. Yeah, it's just really cheesy. Right. Uh. Um, All right, so we get into the book. Uh, We're introduced to Nora, who is our main female character in this novel. Mm. She's so good. She's great, you guys. So basically, Nora is... Here's the thing, and here's the other thing. This book... A lot of it is very, very boring in order to set oh up for God. the twists. There's so much unnecessary so, detail. So much so unnecessary much. shit that no one cares about. So in order to make the twist seem twistier, it's like, oh, everything's just so normal and boring. But yeah, that effect is that like a good percentage of this book is really boring. Yes. Hey, um, what's your favorite water? Because we get to find out in this first chapter what Nora's favorite water is. I don't is. know. I don't, I'm not very particular about my water. Yeah, a lot of it tastes exactly the same. Yeah, it all kind of tastes like water to me. I don't know. Yeah. It's weird. Yeah, but uh, Nora really I guess I just don't have. I guess I just don't have a advanced palate like Nora does. Uh, no, yeah, she's she's very um, high class in she's a way so that high we are class. not. Yeah. So Nora is married to this guy Connor, who is no engaged. Oh, engaged. Sorry, you're right. The, yeah. Yes, because that happens in this first bit is they get engaged, and it's mm-hmm. all very exciting. And she's also married to this other guy named Jeffrey, who is a famous, <laughs> a author, famous author who is so hot and all the girls love, and uh, has tons mm-hmm. of books out. And if James Patterson had anything to do with this book, it was through the character of Jeffrey, who is a self-insert of James Patterson, I'm pretty sure. It's certainly not a self-insert mm-hmm. of Howard Ruffin, who yeah. no one has heard of. Sorry, Howard. Sorry, Howard. <laughs> but yeah, I'm pretty sure Jeffrey is essentially James Patterson. Um, or mm-hmm. how James Patterson thinks he is viewed. The, the James Patterson of historical fiction. Yes, is, yes. I don't know about you, but I... When I think of historical fiction authors, I get all wild inside. Like, yeah, I'm like, mm, yes, give it mm. to me, daddy. Uh, <laughs> actually, and that's the thing. I feel like most historical fiction authors that I read are women. Yeah. I guess maybe the the bar is lower for hot men in that. <laughs> so, yeah, so Jeffrey uh, is also married to Nora, although, like, not <laughs> really. They got married in like a different country on a whim and in Mexico or something or maybe even in the Grand Caymans something like that but so they don't have like an actual marriage license or anything yeah they're they're only married they're not married in the U.S. yeah they're like question mark is that a thing I don't know (laughs) they're married in spirit um (laughs) although I don't know like as someone who is single and does occasionally go on dates like I just feel like it would be so fucking exhausting to like try to be in a relationship with these two guys and it's not like like you know Mm -hmm. like you hear about like oh you know like they have a different family in another state or whatever and it's like Mm -hmm. okay I guess that kind of work if you work out of state and you like are balancing between two very different parts of the country so you can make up the excuse of like oh this is why I'm not at home all the time is because I'm at work Mm -hmm. 20 hours away or whatever. But like these guys live within driving distance of each other. Yeah. And within driving distance of Nora, I guess, because she has a different house in New York, right? Yeah. So she has, she's basically living three lives that she has to keep track of, which she has Connor in Connecticut, I think is where he lives. Mm -hmm. Jeffrey in Boston. Mm-hmm. And then her, her, what she would consider her real life with two best friends and an actual job with business contacts and stuff in New York City. Right. But her job, both of her men know about her job because her job yeah. is uh, she's an interior decorator and 
that's how she met Connor. And is it how she met Jeffrey too? Yes. This is how yeah. she meets her rich husbands is yeah. by okay. decorating their houses. Decorating yes, their houses and, and then fucking them. With them. Um, which I had to, I had to question like how much time is she spending with each of these men? Because that's a lot that's of my, time. Like, that's my point. I'm like, how, how are you finding time to like, juggle all this shit like you have a full-time job that you're actually apparently very good at and you have two long-term committed relationships that are going on and neither one suspects anything at all and you have uh for to fast forward a little bit a mom who you visit constantly who's in an oh yeah uh a facility like it's just like it's too much i'm like when do you like watch netflix man like what is (laughs) Like, what is your life? When do you even have time to decorate the actual houses yeah. of the people that you are working for and not sleeping with? Right. Because we meet, like, several of her clients. We She runs into yeah. clients out and about. She's buying stuff for this client or that client. Like, she's busy with work. But then she's also got these two relationships going on. And I'm just like, even before we get yeah. to the murdering stuff, I'm like, your life is just exhausting. I don't... Why juggle multiple... Like, if, if it's your goal to be this female serial killer who doesn't have a motive that we... Right, <laughs> That we're yeah. ever told of. Again, again with these books about the killers that have bad motives. What... How am I supposed to get invested in this? She... Why would you do multiple crimes at once? Why not just take yeah. it one at a time? Like... Like, she kind of has to be having both at once because otherwise there would be, like, a six-month break in the story between husband killing one and two. Mm -hmm. But it's like, just have it all be backstory. Why does she have to be actively doing this? Yeah. You know? Like, it's just, it's too much. Yeah. Like, tell us the story of her first husband because it gets totally glossed over. Right. It's just like, just like I killed my first husband. Oh, okay. (laughs) why though and when (laughs) and how long did it take you to plan all this like (sighs) there was just there was a lot missing and a lot of buying antique furniture that wasn't necessary to the plot yes and the ridiculous thing is this book was 400 pages long well not really because there was two different um two different previews for other james patterson books in the back (laughs) so that that was probably like a good 50 pages right there (laughs) 350 pages okay 350 pages that there that is so much room to expand on any of these questions we have and it's just like instead gives us these really detailed descriptions of like stuff that doesn't matter the car Nora gets and yeah, just like the furniture she's buying for this one off character that we're never right. going to interact with. It's just and to Evian. like, yeah, it's like, and I get omelets. you're trying to, bu- Oh God, the omelets. <laughs> I get that. You're trying to like build this character and like give her some sort of depth. But at the same time, I don't know, maybe the depth that you should be seeking is why she's murdering people instead of what type yeah. of furniture she's buying for her clients. Like there's one of those things they they both provide some insight to the character, but the insight one on one is better. One is better insight, <laughs> like and would make this book make sense. Yeah, like she has a throwaway line at the end of the book where she's yes, like, I hate men, but never explains why. Right. Well, I think it. I think, and this is kind of we're we're jumping up around a lot. Yeah, in this sorry. Story. <laughs> it's fine. Um, I think the implication is that her. Well, and that was the other thing. The stuff with her mother is so confusing. So, like, her fa- her mother killed her father in front of her when she was six years old mm-hmm. and then went to prison and then faked that she was crazy so that she could be taken out of the prison and put into a nice, cushy facility, which, A, that's not how anything works, yeah. and B, like... That is also not explained, why her mother killed her father. And I think the implication is supposed to be that her father was abusive. Yes. But, like, because they kind of bandy that around a little bit. But it's never, Nora never comments Mm -hmm. on it. Nora never talks about her father. I actually thought at the end, when her mother gave her that note, the big twist was going to be that Mm -hmm. Nora, at six years old, had killed her own father. Oh, and I see, that would have been sweet. That would have been so good, right? Yes. But that didn't happen. The note that her mother gave her was just, hey, I'm actually not crazy. Yeah. Like, uh, and, okay, we need, well, and we need to we talk need about to get it when we the get plot. there. Well, yeah, we need to put that, put that on the top shelf for a second and we'll come back to it because <laughs> I have some thoughts about that letter and that whole scene with the stupid nurse. 
is with Emily the nurse. Emily the nurse. Like my namesake. Um <laughs> God. Okay, so all right, so where were we? So we so, met Nora. This we is met like, Nora. We literally have only discussed the first chapter. Um, okay, so, well, it was actually probably like the first five chapters because these chapters were really fucking short. They're like two pages like, long. There's 111 chapters or something like it's that ridiculous. in this book, which is insane. And That's they each unnecessary. end on a cliffhanger. <laughs> yes, and it's which most of the cliffhangers are just not really cliffhangers. It's just you not telling, like, again, yeah, the author uh, yeah. not telling us a thing that all of the characters know. Yes. So it's very annoying. Um, <laughs> God. So we meet Nora. She has two husbands. We go through some nonsense. Well, she doesn't have two husbands. She has one husband and one boy Soon who's to engaged to her. And we go through some stuff about her life and her trying to juggle the two of them and whatnot. And then she ends up murdering Connor uh, by feeding him an omelet. And then that gives him stomach pains. And then she gives him medicine to help the stomach pains. And then he dies. Yes. Some sort of combination of chemicals and drugs in his system that completely disappear. And even from an autopsy can never be traced. That make it look like he's had a heart attack. Cardiac arrest. Yeah. Yeah. So that happens. Um, She goes into his, his bank accounts and moves some money around so that she gets the majority of his money. Yes. Yeah. Th- yeah. That's a big point. The, uh, the Grand Cayman offshore accounts, she has one, as do all of the men that she attempts to kill and rob. So they have the funeral. His sister, Elizabeth, or Lizzie, shows up. And at first, Lizzie mm-hmm. is very suspicious of Nora's intentions. She's like, oh, she's just trying to, she's in this for the money. She's probably going to contest the will. Nora's like, no, 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 I don't care about the money. Of course, you should have the money, all this other stuff. And Lizzie's like, oh, okay, cool. You can have mm-hmm. the furniture in the house. It's all good. Because, of course, Nora doesn't, mm-hmm. you know, care about the money that's left because she's, she's already taken the majority of it. And she's got a house and another husband. Oh, yeah, and she's and got shit. like <laughs> plenty of other shit. Two other houses, actually. Right. Full of furniture. In between this, we've had this viewpoint shift chapters in for so all of this is in third person then we have a few chapters that are in third person as well but are about someone named Mm -hmm. the tourist who is involved in a situation with a briefcase someone's being held hostage over it and he gets involved in the hostage situation he ends up shooting the guy with the briefcase and he takes the briefcase and he goes and looks through the briefcase and finds a file and reads the file and there's all this stuff about money transfers and then he passes the file and the briefcase on to someone else but we don't know who he is and we don't know what the file's about but he knows that you know like this means something so mm. he yeah. understands fully the file but he won't tell us what it is so again it's just the author's not telling us things. yeah and we don't th- this guy we're kind of led to believe that he is like not on the up and up and he is a lone wolf kind of mercenary yeah hire or gun for hire kind of guy he doesn't seem to have a support network yeah no affiliations to anyone whatsoever and literally he's just referred to as the tourist from here until the end of the book <laughs> so put a pin in that yep <laughs> remember that <laughs> remember that super unnecessary detail so then we've got that going on and then we've got chapters that are in first person from this guy named supposedly Craig <sighs> who supposedly is an insurance agent but obviously something else is going on so he's talking to his boss Susan who mm-hmm. about how they're going to get in, t- in contact with Nora and they're going to start this whole investigation and maybe it's an insurance investigation, but it doesn't seem like it. So Craig goes to talk to Nora. He's like, hey, all of this money um, could be yours from this life 1. insurance. $1.9 million. $1.9 million dollars from this life insurance policy that Connor took out a month after mm-hmm. meeting you and put you down as the beneficiary. Yes. And this was the point where I'm like, either a Nora is a fucking moron mm-hmm. who does not deserve any money because she's a moron or <laughs> B Nora has the most magical vagina of anyone ever. Of course. And so it seems like that's a normal thing to do that someone would agree to put you down as the beneficiary after dating you for a month, because that's an insane thing to do. And <laughs> 
believing that that happened <laughs> makes you a moron or you have to have some reason to believe that that's a thing that could happen like having a magic vagina then just give millions of dollars to her all the time i don't know right like i'm, I'm just like, like <laughs> I, it was it was so stupid it was yeah and it, we get these chapters from craig's first person point of view and th- these chapters are in first person perspective and so we're just being force fed these lines that like Craig, you're so smart for thinking of this plot, and you were the only one that could possibly have handled this situation. And we need, and you're, we, you were specifically hand chosen to deal with Nora and figure out what's going on with Nora and seeing if <laughs> this death. It's is not suspicious. a super genius plot. Like, like, <laughs> it's all dumb. It's it's not like why did to do this whole insurance thing? It's yes, just like it's, why did we need to do this huge just a lot of loops sting again to give the author to something to lie to the audience about? Yes. Because, of course, it's eventually revealed yes. that it's not an insurance thing at all. The FBI is investigating her. Which you would know if you read the back of the fucking book. It is right there right. on the back of the book. And the author doesn't reveal it until 30% of the way through the story. And you're like, no shit, Sherlock. And they act like it's a big twist. And it's like, it's not, though. Yes, because... <laughs> the back of the book says, like, FBI agent John O'Hara is investigating her. And Craig is claiming that he has a boss named John O'Hara that is suspicious of um, Nora, Nora and, and wants her. to do the investigation to see if this death was legitimate or whatever. Like, <laughs> So, guess what, guys? Craig is John O'Hara. Yeah, wow, surprise. And he works for the FBI. Fucking shocker. Yeah, and you know what? I think his previous, like, his list of qualifications was writing spam emails to grandmas because that is exactly what the scam is. <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, it was so, it's so dumb and like, yeah. she's dumb for falling for it. <laughs> yeah, and th- there were a few times where I was like, okay, maybe Nora sees through this ploy. Like, she, yes. she's getting suspicious, she's following him and checking on his office and stuff, but like, she just lets shit slide. She's like, no... No, he's right. He probably would have left me almost $2 million immediately after meeting me. Yes, because we'd known each other for a month, and I'm just that amazing in bed that all men who sleep with me immediately take out life insurance policies Mm -hmm. with me as the beneficiary for nearly $2 million. That's a normal thing. And it should be noted that Connor is not an old... He's 40. Mm. He's 40, and he already has his will set up and his estate and everything. Yeah, all of her victims are, like, really rich, good-looking guys Mm -hmm. that are around her age. Like, maybe 10 years old or so. And evading the tax man. (laughs) And evading, yeah. So I'm just like, I don't know. I feel like that demographic isn't necessarily going to be that charmed by a woman. Right. Like, Like, I'm like... Why are all of these guys ready to settle down, I guess, is my question. <laughs> I, that Yeah, that's a very good question. Because they Con- at, the, at the time that Connor proposes to what's-her-name, they've only known each other six months. Right. And it's not like they met each other, I don't know, at a dating sort of, like, it, mm-hmm. a dating situation. It's, you know, she was their interior decorator and then was just so charming and amazing, which none of that is shown on page. She seems yeah. fucking annoying. Yes. She's but completely bland. She's right. Uh, <laughs> but like, yeah, these guys, all of these guys just and all of them, every guy she comes in contact with, because it's not just the ones she's married slash engaged slash murdering like her mm-hmm. other clients all think she's charming and delightful. <sighs> uh, her lawyer thinks like keeps staring at her boobs the entire meeting. Mm-hmm. And Craig slash John, when he first meets her, keeps talking about how good looking and attractive she is. And then of course, as things go on, Craig slash John starts fucking her. Because Yes. How could he resist her? How could he she's resist? so beautiful and perfect with her brown hair and green eyes. And she's very thin. Right. I'm like, okay, whatever. And she has no personality. I don't get it. <laughs> yeah, I don't understand either. She <laughs> You can't just keep saying <laughs> so, someone is charming and then not have them do anything charming on the page. Yeah. When when Connor proposed to her, her response was to say, yippee, yay, I love you so much. <laughs> <laughs> and they have these 
these like stupid mantras that they repeat to each other and like oh my god i forgot about that everything is just so fucking cheesy she has just everything she does I, and that's the thing everyone in this book none of them talk like people none of them talk like human beings they just they talk like if a 12 year old was watching mm-hmm. a pg-13 movie spy movie that he knew he wasn't supposed to and he's like this is so cool and then he was like trying to tell his <laughs> friends the next day about this movie that it would be the type of dialogue he comes mm-hmm. up with where it's like supposed to sound really like slick yes. but it's just it's in situations that don't need that sort of affectation it was like Michael Scott wrote this. Yes! <laughs> agent Michael Scarn. It was an Agent Michael Scarn book, you guys. <laughs> that was this book. It was so bad. <laughs> oh, uh, man. And even, even just like the method of writing this book. So, again, Craig pops up. I don't know what percentage of the book he pops up in. It's um. – let me – let me see real quick. I probably have it notated because it pissed well, me the, off so madly. The tourist pops up in chapter six, which is 5% of the way through the book. Mm-hmm. And Nora, Nora, Nora. It takes her like 10 chapters just to fucking kill him. From the from the moment she walks in the, disor- in the dorms, like, know, I'm going to kill so him. And then 10 much. chapters later, I was like, just fucking kill him. Just please fucking He kill raised... Him. The fork with the omelet towards his mouth. And then he, it's like, end of chapter. And then he set it down and they had a conversation about, like, that's the sort of thing. It keeps being cliffhangers, but it doesn't lead anywhere. Okay, here it is. Chapter 25. Oh, my God. Two, the insurance man. Page, okay, this is 20% of the way through the book. We've been having, except for that prologue chapter, we've been having chapters in Mm -hmm, alternating mm -hmm. third person point of views until this point and all of a sudden it's in first person it's so jarring i hated it jarring i hated it i i absolutely hate it and mm. also they kept it they kept using the the phrase things aren't always as they appear which is i guess a phrase that that craig's dad or john's dad told him Uh but they use it in the first section before we're introduced to craig also and it gets repeated so much and it's like Things aren't always as they appear because you aren't telling us what what things appear like. You aren't giving us all of the information. Exactly. Yeah. There, it's, we we have things aren't no always way as they appear because you're that. lying to me. He's like you can't just say. It's like he went through the whole book going, but wait, <laughs> but wait, there's happen. more. Yeah. Hold on. <laughs> I'll show you. No, wait a second, mine. it's coming. <laughs> How stupid. Oh, man. And then also pretty much everything was exactly as it appeared once we had the information. Yeah. They they just, he just wanted to, he tried so hard. Whoever, whichever of these men actually wrote this book was trying so hard to surprise us. And it wasn't it, surprising at all. Yeah. Oh, where the fuck are we in this? <laughs> so she killed Connor and Craig shows mm, up. And, and then it's revealed that Craig is John. After they exhume Cotter, Connor's body, which was... Oh, yeah. Yeah, we have to go through this whole fucking charade for ages. Before, <laughs> right. Like, we, we there get was it. so we get much. It. Like, there was so much of this charade. But it was... <sighs> where it was... They weren't telling... Like, again, they weren't telling the audience exactly what was going on. But it was just... We all knew. We all knew what was happening. Yes. We're not idiots. Also, like, maybe talk to your publisher and don't put that on the back of the book if you wanted it to be yeah. that big of a surprise. Like, ugh. They get through all this, then uh, Craig starts having a relationship with Nora, and they're fucking a lot. Which and also makes no sense. Why is Nora so attracted to him? Is it because she he's leading, also leading a duplicitous life around her? That was, like, the only reasoning I guess, that they gave us. I guess. I think that... He's just, again, just like we keep being told over and over again that Nora is mm-hmm. charming and amazing, we're supposed to, like, we've been told that John Smart is and attractive. the bee's knees, and I guess that, but again, we don't really see that, because the only thing we get from him is this dumb plan, which is mm-hmm. dumb. It, yeah, it, it's a very, like, unnerving amount of <laughs> devotion already from her. I think that's what it was. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's the thing, like, they're... It's almost like romance novel vibe where mm-hmm. they see each other and they're like just instantly in love and are imagining a life together and all this mm-hmm. other stuff. And it's like, you guys just met. You need to call, even, even if the twists that are not twisty, never twisted, mm-hmm. if we <laughs> assume that Nora was actually just in the wrong place at the wrong time and uh-huh. a normal person uh-huh. and that Craig slash John was really an insurance man, like... This would be an insane relationship to 
go from having just met after mm-hmm. your fiance dies and immediately being like, I'm in love with this guy and we're going to spend our life together and maybe our, maybe I'll settle down with him. like And have kids, yeah. And have kids. Like, you need to calm down. You've known him for five minutes. Yeah. And of those five minutes, three of them were spent in New York with your real life and another minute was spent with your other husband, Jeffrey. So, mm-hmm. like, really one minute. And your mom. And, and your mom, right. So, like, 30 seconds mm-hmm. is how much time you've known this man. So, so you need to calm 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 like i don't even like it, it all comes to a head they yeah the whole, it's oh. such a mismatched plot of things happening simultaneously that it's, yes it's almost impossible to recap quickly <laughs> right so i guess the next major plot point is she and i mean we're skipping a lot of stuff but all of it doesn't matter um she goes to follow craig because she's suspicious of him or mm-hmm. whatever mm-hmm. And finds that he has a secret family of which we, the audience, have heard nothing about up to this point, by the way. Right. Even though we've been in John's head multiple times. Like, he's never mentioned wife or kids. So, again, it's just the author's not telling us things. Mm -hmm. It would be fine if we weren't in Craig slash John's head for a significant portion of this If it stayed third person, it would have been fine, probably. Um, Or finer. Not not fine. Great, but, but, you know. Better. Yeah. She sees Craig at this house with these two little boys and this woman who she assumes is his wife. And she sees the mailbox says O'Hara, which. <gasps> dun, dun, dun. Like, OK, I get it. You needed some way for her to figure this out. But mm-hmm. who who puts their name on a mailbox still? <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, and especially an FBI agent. Yes. Yes. Mm. I'm like, that's. An undercover FBI agent whose job is being undercover, but is also using his real name in his little... In his scam. Uh, scam. <laughs> like, what? why did you do... Why yeah, did you use you, your real name, you number one? could have come up with literally any other name. <laughs> right. <laughs> Here, I'll do, I'll do it right now. Bob Lawrence. <laughs> <laughs> Timothy Olson. It's really easy. <laughs> and then you just have to remember that one name. I mean, like, yeah. Right. Not I as guess easy that as was, remembering your own name. I guess that was the thing. He wasn't sure he'd be able to remember a made-up name. <laughs> like, the name that he already made up and gave to himself. That's true. That was he could, the like, name to why him. Didn't he just Why didn't he just use his real name as his name and then call his boss Craig whatever? <laughs> why did he need a fake name? It wasn't, this was 2005. It wasn't like she was going to Facebook him. Like, exactly. This is so stupid. Why did he call himself Craig? Just call yourself John O'Hara and say your boss's name, Craig, whatever. <laughs> oh, you dumb bitch. <laughs> this is the best. This is, this is the, the cream of the crop of the FBI though, Em. I don't think you understand. <laughs> like he was the only one who could do this job. The only one who could do this. His instincts are always on point. On point. He never makes a mistake. It's so dumb. So she figures out that <laughs> Craig is John O'Hara, and also he's cheating on her by having a wife. And she goes full insane she woman She goes full, on him. full crazy, crazy woman. Yeah. So she, her first plan is to just murder him in the way, oh, she's also murdered Jeffrey at this point. <laughs> I forgot to mention that because Jeffrey oh, yeah. is a non-entity she, in this book. Oh, yeah. There was there was no... Again, why did she have to have two husbands at once to kill? No one knows because... No one knows. Literally, the only Just put reason, him in the backstory. Yes. And the only reason she was even with this guy was so that she could tell the nurse that she was going to get his autograph for him or something. Right. I don't know. It was so uh, stupid. It was dumb. You could have taken out all the Jeffrey parts. Uh, ever, yes. So she tries to murder John Craig by <laughs> like let's that was her first her first idea I'll just kill him <laughs> I'll just murder him in the way that I've murdered every other person and now yeah. now I think this guy is as, like she doesn't know he's an FBI agent but she knows he's some sort of investigator uh-huh. into this death she doesn't think that if he ends up dying in the exact same way as the guy that they were investigating, that no one's going to be suspicious of that. Like, <laughs> come on. So many, so many heart attacks right. going around. Like, I get, I get days. that, you know, she was completely separate, her life with Jeffrey and her life with Tom. Mm-hmm. So they didn't connect mm-hmm. those. But 
Really? Like, you don't think that they're going to be like, huh, it's weird. This guy was investigating the death of a man who dropped dead of a heart attack in his 40s and who was involved with this woman. And then he started being involved with this woman. And then he dropped dead of a heart attack. And he was also in his 40s. So that's a little weird. But I guess it's fine. What a weird weird coincidence. coincidence. That's probably fine. And we shouldn't investigate it any further. Right. Like, what was she thinking? I don't understand. But that's her first plan is to just poison him in the same way she's poisoned all of her other husbands. Yes. So she tries, but he starts getting sick and he's like, oh, she's poisoned me. It's happening. And he goes to the bathroom, which is, I believe, the scene from the beginning. Mm Mm-hmm. Which, and here's the other flaw with her murder plans, is it's a two-step process. Yeah. So the first poison that she gives them doesn't, it doesn't make them sick enough to kill them. It just makes them sick enough to go to the bathroom and throw up a bunch. And then she... The, the the second poison she administers is something similar to like a um what are those called the plop plop fizz fizz Alka-Seltzer. Alka-Seltzer, thank you yeah <laughs> basically she like tricks them into drinking a glass of what is supposedly alka seltzer um but is actually right, the second which, poison so it's like this is a messy two step process which I don't know if about you but personally as like a person who has occasionally thrown up in my life. <laughs> Never have I ever tried to treat it in any way. Yeah, no, so, I like, think like the, the throwing idea up is, the, is treating it. Like you're getting yeah, it out I'm like of I'm getting body. rid of it. It's fine. Yeah, don't don't put more things in me. I'm good. <laughs> well, and then plus, how is she like? She does not have a guarantee that once they drink the Alka Seltzer, that it's gonna stay down. They're throwing up. They could right. just immediately throw that up, and then where are you gonna be? Yeah. Stupid I just girl. don't. It's a bad plan. It's a, but apparently it's worked. It's worked three times. Why not? Three a out of four times. Yeah. So seventy five percent. Not bad. She tries to poison him. He doesn't take the second part of the poison. He stays in the bathroom, and he's like, "I'm gonna call the police or whatever." Mm-hmm. Which why why would he call? Why 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 did he call nine one one and not his fucking boss? Like I guess because he thought nine one one would get there faster. I don't know. It's stupid because his whole thing was he's like, oh, the nine one one operator will tell her boss who will tell my boss. I'm like, and why didn't you call your boss? Someone, yeah, just call right. your boss and be like, she got me, and then they'll right. know exactly what's going on as opposed to calling nine one one and having to go, hello, hello, is anyone there? And be like, hello? hey, this guy who claims he's an FBI agent is weirdly calling nine one one for some reason. Yeah, because that's the thing. He calls nine one one and he's like, I'm an FBI agent and I'm. With Nora Sinclair. But, and, oh, no. And he can't yeah. finish the and phone then, call. Like, <laughs> and then, like, he, Nora gets her, well, at some point, Nora gets her gun and shoots him. Yes. That was that was her second murder plan, is if she can't poison right. him, she will shoot, shoot him. Shoot him through the door, which, I guess. You know, that won't look that's, suspicious. Right. A, that that's a bad plan. And B, I don't know. You haven't murdered people by shooting them before. You probably aren't that good of a shot. Shooting them through the door is probably not mm-hmm. the best idea. But she hits him. <laughs> but she, yeah, she hits him in the shoulder or something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. You know, and he's some... got a gun and he shoots back. Yeah, but she it's takes off. Dramatic. The cops show up, and then she... well, she takes off and she goes. She's like, does the city where your family lives mean anything to you? No, and she, then she, she drives away. She calls when the, like, it's after the cops have shown up that she says that. So I think she leaves and then calls oh, him. Oh, real. I think. Let me go this look it so, up. It was so hectic. It was, it was, was a just, lot going on. I mean, it, it took her four chapters to say it, so. So she leaves. Uh-huh. And he passes out. Oh, and that's right. wakes up to the smell of burning rice because they were cooking beforehand. Mm -hmm. And then the cops have shown up at that point and they're like, we don't know where she is because we don't know anything about her because you didn't give us a description. (laughs) Yeah, dummy. (laughs) And then, yeah, she calls while they're in the cabin that they're at. Yeah. And uh, is like, I'm going after your family. Uh, Yeah. They all go tearing (laughs) off to get to his family. So step one, try to murder the guy. (laughs) Step two, try to murder the rest of his family. No, step one, try to murder the guy. Step two, try to murder the guy in a different way than you just tried to oh, murder yeah. the guy. Because yeah, yeah. that one didn't work. <laughs> step three, make general threats about his family. Yes. Yeah, tell, tell him you know where his family lives. Yes. So they all go tearing off to protect his family, and they get there, and she's not there. But then mm-hmm. she calls, 
and they put her on speakerphone and she's like, I just want you to know, Mrs. O'Hara, that your husband and I have been fucking. And like, so, that's so, her big plan. So step four, <laughs> reveal the affair. And she are at this point, she does know he's an FBI agent because he has told her. Yes. He has told like, her, you shouldn't have done that because I'm... Like, you're going to be arrested for murder. Yeah, for murdering and, an, an FBI I agent. mean, I guess, to be fair, it's probably a good thing that her plan wasn't actually... Because I don't think she was actually actually planning to kill his family. Mm-hmm. I think she was just, like... Wanted him trying to go to... the opposite direction. Yeah. yeah. So, like... It's probably a good idea that her big revenge scheme was ruin his marriage instead mm-hmm. of murder his children. Because if she's already wanted for murder and then she murders the FBI guy's children, they're going to look for him, her even harder. Yeah. So I guess it's not the dumbest move in the world. It's just, it's like, if you're going to do that, why are you being petty and like calling and ruining his On marriage? Which, which it is then revealed immediately that, it goes, okay, so she she calls. It says, Nora hung up. The room was deathly silent as I looked my wife in the eye. Actually, my ex-wife for the past two years. She shook her head. <laughs> and what, like, and you wonder actually. why we got a divorce, you prick. Again, so again, this is something that the character knows and has known. Yes. But the author just hasn't bothered to tell us. So they're treating it like it's a twist. It's like, no, you just mm-hmm. didn't tell us. Like, yes. that's not a twist. We have no reason to care about this reveal whatsoever. Right. Also. And and it completely undoes, like, her, uh, Nora's entire reaction. Yes. Because she was like, I cannot believe that he would cheat on me with his wife. Like, because I think that's how she frames it in her mind is, mm-hmm. like, I'm being cheated on. Which, right. Okay, whatever, honey. Okay, sure. Um, she didn't like, she didn't like the fact that he lied about being in the relationship already. Not, she, it wasn't the fact that he lied about who he was. Mm -hmm. Like, she was not mad. Like, wait, you're the guy that's been investigating me and giving me a hard time about this $1.9 million? No, it was, wait, you're married? (laughs) That's what sends her off the handle. But he wasn't even really married. So. So, like, if she had calmly asked him instead of immediately planning to murder him like if your reaction is when someone makes you mad is to murder them well i guess i guess you might be the problem you yeah you might be the bad guy <laughs> just just maybe i don't know uh, nora runs off in hiding they track her down they arrest her but then that mm-hmm. oh and of course there's mm-hmm. a there's a um little side story about how john gets has to go through a ethics review for sleeping with his target. Which, I guess which I don't know cares? why he told them that much. Like, well, because she announced it on the phone and oh, it was on right, speakerphone. Right, 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 right. Never mind. I, and I, I am know, the dumb one. It was me. I was the stupid <laughs> <and> one. <laughs> we know who his ex-wife is at the end of this book, so uh, she would have told them again. Another stupid yeah. fucking twist. Another stupid twist. Um. um <laughs> so he and. Susan, his boss, go down to track down Nora. They find her and arrest her. And then it's revealed. Or, yeah, yeah, they they arrest her at that point, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then it's revealed that Susan, his boss, is also his ex-wife. Oh, how zany. Which, again, is a thing that the characters knew the entire time. And they just didn't tell us. It had literally no bearing on the story whatsoever. It did not right, change the relationship. It did not change the outcome of the story. It, like, it was just a fact. Oh, and I guess we should say they tracked her down by going and, uh, because the nurse at her mother's. Yeah, so back to the um, letter thing. Hospital. Yeah, yeah, that whole thing. So Olivia, the mother of Nora, writes Nora a letter. Mm-hmm. Because I guess Nora comes to her very upset after killing Connor or Jeffrey. I don't remember which one. After killing one of her husbands, she goes to her mother very upset and is about to reveal something terrible. She's, she says, I've done these awful things. I want to tell you about them. And then her mom has a seizure. Very conveniently timed seizure. So Nora leaves that day without telling her mom anything. But she comes back another day and her mom... In this third person perspective, we suddenly dive into the mom's mind and we find out that the mom has been pretending to be crazy the whole time and she... Uh, Which we already knew because of the book thing. Yeah, we already knew because... Because she gets books and she reads them upside down. Isn't she so wacky? But then we see a little bit where 
everyone leaves the room and she turns the book jacket upside down so she can read it right side up but everybody thinks she it's upside down and she's crazy yeah <sighs> which is dumb considering what is later revealed that everything in that room is monitored by cameras exactly and what if she got so, her paperbacks i don't know so so she writes her daughter a letter saying something. We never really find out what, do we? I'm assuming it's just basically her explaining. I'm not, like, crazy, I'm not crazy, I think is what it is. Yeah, and you need to get your shit together because they record these sessions, so don't come in right. here with your drama. I don't know. That's what I'm assuming. It said. <laughs> and she puts it in her daughter's purse, Nora's purse. Nora leaves that day after visiting with her mother, goes to talk to the nurse as she's checking out checking out leaving i don't signing out that's the word i'm looking for as she's signing out leaves her purse behind and the purse is open and so the nurse decides to go snooping through Nora's purse well she sees the yeah, letter she sees the letter it's on the which, top okay but I, that doesn't mean you can read it <laughs> yeah and i don't know if it was because like oh she's like criminally insane we need to monitor all correspondence or whatever but I mean, I'm assuming if Olivia was smart enough to pretend to have some sort of, and and this is what her condition is described as, is a, it's a combination of autism oh, yeah. and Alzheimer's. Yeah, that That's, line. Yeah. Well, mm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, oh, sure. right. That's a thing. So <laughs> she. You know, that, that type of autism that sets in when you're in prison at the age of like mm-hmm. 40 something mm-hmm. you know that that type of autism yeah yeah late on what are you autism talking about early like, onset what? alzheimer's right like what uh what like i guess what why I mean, would... like <laughs> and it was it was like a conversation between two nurses why wouldn't they just say what the name of the condition was i think right, they could assume right. the it's other like, one knew what it was i'm not sure if they were saying like it is a separate condition that has a name or a separate condition, and we don't know what yeah. the condition is, but its symptoms are like autism and Alzheimer's. Mm-hmm. Or if they were literally just saying, oh, yeah, she's got autism and Alzheimer's. Like, I don't know, because everything in this book was so poorly written. Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so you would think if she was smart enough to pretend to have the autism, Alzheimer's for Disease. however many years she was in jail. Yeah. She'd be smart enough to, like, not write on the front of the envelope, to my daughter Nora from your mother Olivia. Like, you right. would think it would just be a plain envelope. Which maybe it was, because it doesn't say if it had details on the front. Yeah, this nurse Emily just snooped. And the next time they go to see Olivia, it's with John and Yeah, they Susan. get a, they get a tip off they go from to Emily. Yes. That they have allowed Olivia to continue after after discovering the deception, have allowed Olivia to continue staying at this facility as opposed to going back to prison if she agrees to cooperate in their investigation. Which why and this nurse has her, the power to make that decision, I don't know. I yeah, n- no one knows. She's very yeah, she's whatever. But the way that Olivia cooperates with the investigation is by allowing them to look at the box of books that Nora sent her which has a piece of stationery in it from the hotel where she's currently staying like a (laughs) dum-dum. So that's how they find Nora. That's how they find Nora. Um, But then the FBI releases Nora because, as it turns out, all that shit with the tourist, it has been revealed at this point that the tourist is John. Da-da-da! Same person. So he's been working two cases. The file that he found was like... It was tracking... It was surprisingly timely. It was like they were tracking... Yeah. ...politicians' funds. Well, right. Well, its first phrase is they were just track... They were tra- it was... Because he's part of the anti-terrorist tra- yes. task force. So they were tracking big amounts of money moving in and out of the country. Mm-hmm. Like Patriot But then stuff. John realizes it's not just general. It's specifically they're interested in politicians donating to... Um, or receiving donations mm, yeah, from. Yeah. So John uses that oh, info to influenced. get released from the FBI on leave, but paid leave. So Yeah, so he he gets off the hook because he knows that and he and the FBI would be super embarrassed and the politicians would be super embarrassed if that information got out. So he's basically blackmailing his the FBI. Um, and then Nora gets out because Nora gets out because of that because they don't want to have to put that yes. information because that's how they found Nora in the yeah. first place was because of the movement of 
the money between the accounts. Yes, they that don't she want did. that to so go they're to like, trial. Right. So they're like, this is very suspicious. Let's investigate it. But then once all this comes out, they're like, oh, no, we can't send this to trial because then all of this will get out mm-hmm. and it will be bad. So they let Nora off the hook. But then Nora gets murdered by Connor's sister, Elizabeth, <sighs> who has been following her the entire time and wearing a wig. And that's why she didn't recognize her. And Elizabeth murders her and then leaves a note or like calls into the FBI and is like, hey, I got Nora. I got Connor, whoever's murderer. You can come pick her up at Connor's house. Mm-hmm. And they're like, oh, guess she's dead. And that's pretty much the book. Yeah. So that's the book. Yeah. That and she kills it. her by, by spiking her Evian, which I thought was, <laughs> wow, good thing they mentioned that at the very beginning. She wasn't going to be drinking no tap water. And good thing they mentioned that things aren't always as they appear so that we knew that that woman in the blonde wig was actually a different blonde woman. Yeah. When she took off the wig. Because that was the thing. It's like Ugh, she was, they specifically yeah. said she was wearing a blonde wig, but like Liz has blonde hair. Yes. <laughs> it's just Which, like shorter. Yeah. So, so like, the sister, she's like popped up in like maybe two or three other chapters. She's yeah. Like she like calls to check in on Nora and be like, yes. oh, how's it going? Sort and there's of thing. Just like a couple mentions of a blonde woman who is following her at a yeah. couple times. Like, it's not a constant threat, but I don't know. I mean, it's pretty obvious. The only other like, blonde character she's... in the book was Lizzie, and they mention a blonde character following Nora around and questioning her movement. Like, But, like, the fact that the, it's then, like, she whips off a wig. Yeah. I'm like, why? Yeah. Why? Wait, she's You blonde. might not recognize me with this hair, but how about the right. same hair? And then she takes off the wig, and she's still like, oh, wait a second. Oh, it's Lizzie. So, like, she wouldn't have recognized her anyway. Yeah, which... I'm pretty Ugh. sure you would because, well, whatever. So this book was dumb. Everyone in it was dumb. I, I hated it. None of it, yes. None of it made sense. And it, it, it suffered from the same problem that there's someone inside your house suffered from. Where it's just oh, like, yeah. the killer didn't have a very good motive. And so... Which, at least with there's someone inside your house, that and I kind of said that in this ep- that episode, like, that was supposed to be, like, a slasher thing. Like, slasher mm-hmm. killers don't always have great motives. His motive that he That's gave true. was stupid, but the motive is less important in those type of stories. This one, it's like, we spend so much time in Nora's head. Not, like, first person, but third, first, close third person. Yeah, third person close. Um, like, yeah. we should have, we should be able to understand why she did this, but no, it's just like, I guess just for the money, but, like, I don't know, she was good at her job, why didn't she just keep doing her job? Exactly, she, she wasn't a ton of money from that. And she wasn't mind. using the money for anything. Mm-mm. Like, I thought, I thought either it was gonna turn out that she had killed her father at a young age, and, like, she was just always, like, that... She's a little bit touched. Yeah, like, that caused her to, like, snap in this way or whatever. Uh Uh-huh. Or that something was going to turn up with... Because her mom had been in this, like, private facility for years. It's like, who was paying for that? Because it's, Mm -hmm. like, a nice facility. That's a good question. Yeah, so I thought that she was murdering people to pay for her mom's care. Yeah, which also would have been... that would have been something, at least. Yeah, a little bit something you could cling on to yeah. but no it's just like she's just like murdering people because she likes murdering people and likes money i guess i don't know you i don't know like, i yeah. like money too but i don't murder people for it like this seems extreme <laughs> uh, maybe uh, we should start though maybe no anna <laughs> <laughs> and for the for, to be fair there is a sequel I think there's a cut. Co- I think this is the first in the series. Let me I think there's only of two, of and it's not really a sequel about Nora. It's about John. Oh well, then yeah. So nothing gets yeah. explained, huh? No. Well, because they weren't. I don't think they were planning to make it a sequel. They just kind of like wrote it, and they're like, "Oh, this guy." Yeah. So I don't know. Did you have anything else to say about this book? Um. No, I just went to Howard Howard Ruffin dot com. His website. Oh yeah, and it's like it's like a. It's under construction. Yeah. And it says, after a mere decade or so of procrastination, HowardRuffin.com is finally being updated. In the meantime, you may continue to heap praise on him at his email address at Yahoo.com. His email address is like his last name and some numbers. He couldn't even, like, <laughs> and it's at Yahoo.com. I have I don't have a lot of um, optimism that that is going to be updated anytime soon. But he soon. tried. Well, and that's the thing. I'm like, I can't really fault. He tried. It's hard to, like... When you read a bad book, you kind of want to blame someone. Mm-hmm. 
And again, I keep saying bad book and, you know, different people prefer different types of books and that's fine. Mm -hmm. But when you read a book that you don't like, you kind of want to be like, oh, I don't like this author. But it's like, I don't know who to blame for this. I don't know if it's James Patterson or if it's Howard Ruffin. It's like, even if it is Howard's mainly his writing, which I suspect it probably is, Mm -hmm. how much effort are you going to put into this book that really isn't going to do that much for you? You know, like it's... Yeah. People are still going to credit James Patterson as the writer. Why would you try that hard, you know? (laughs) That's a good question. Yeah, I guess I don't really, I don't really know a lot about or care to know a lot about this whole, like, The world of James Patterson. With, in quotations, a famous author. I mean, I think, and I think James Patterson is one of the most infamous for doing this at this point because Mm -hmm. he has... Like, I literally, I was looking it up. I'm like, how many books has James Patterson actually written? Mm -hmm. And the Google response was like, around 57 for how many he's actually written. Because nobody knows. Nobody knows how many books. Nobody knows, like. he's not about to tell anyone. Right. To what extent he's actually overseeing this or if they're literally just slapping his name on the cover. Like, it's it's kind of unclear. And it's like, he's more of a brand than a writer, really, at this point. (laughs) He's like the Thomas Kincaid of authors. And I mean, like, there are definitely whatever it's fine it's just i i mean he's he's obviously successful at what he does he sells hundreds millions of books mm-hmm. but i don't know just lots something, of people like lots it. of people like him but i don't yeah. know something about the whole which this is kind of leading into my rather be reading for this week which is a huge huge stretch but this is just what I was thinking about reading um, mm-hmm. this book. And it's yet another YA book, which should surprise no one, really, at this point. Uh, but I was thinking about how, like, you know, he is this famous writer who did – he started off, he's writing his own books, and then he basically became a brand and, um, mm-hmm. you know, it, is using all of these other writers to – increase his own brand essentially and I I don't know I feel like it's gross and I don't really like it but I I can't comment on it super hard because I haven't read a lot of James Patterson branded books this is the only James Patterson I've ever read yeah and the other author who I'm thinking of who does something similar at this point is Rick Reardon who wrote the Percy Jackson series yeah where he now has a bunch of other books that are part of his like imprint But he's not sitting there saying, like, I wrote this. He's saying, hey, this is a book about a culture that I'm not familiar with that someone from that culture is writing about. And I'm going to give it like I'm going to lift it up and let them do the talking like which is if you're a famous author and you want to, like, build an empire. Like, I feel like that's such a better way to go about it where you're not you're not like people. It's you know, like, I think the books still say, like, from the I can't remember exactly. It, I didn't. I had no idea he was doing this. I'd stopped reading. Yeah, he doesn't. He stuff. he doesn't like say like I wrote these books. He's like, mm-hmm. pre, it's like presented I'm by answering these. Yeah, books, it's like presented kind of? by Rick Reardon or something like that. Okay. Let me see if I. Yeah, it's the Rick the Rick Reardon presents okay. imprint. So it's like, still, it's giving other authors the credit that they deserve. He's not sitting there saying, oh, I wrote this book It's and this person helped me. He's saying like, hey, I can't talk about this situation or this mythology because it doesn't belong to me. Here's someone who can. So like the most recent one is um, Aru Shah and the End of Time, which is by Roshani Chakshi. And I haven't read it yet, but it's been on my to be read list for a while. So that's going to be my rather be reading for okay. this week, this fortnight. Huh, I've never heard of that. Um, one. And it's about Hindu mythology. Oh, that's neat. And it's supposedly really, really good. That sounds really cool. Yeah, I stopped reading him. I think I read the first Magnus Chase book. Mm-hmm. And then I yeah, don't even I'm really... know if I finished Heroes of Olympus, to be honest. Yeah, I'm pretty behind on his books. I've always really enjoyed them. They're cute. Um, they're easy some to of them, read. Yeah. They're easy to read. Some of them are for a younger audience, but. Yeah, I think that the way that he uses his own fame to amplify other authors instead of using his mm-hmm. own fame to amplify his own fame is uh, pretty admirable compared to the way that, to me, someone relatively unfamiliar with James Patterson's work, it seems that James Patterson is doing. Yeah, it's kind of like that whole conversation of like doing it for the exposure mm-hmm. and whether or not that's really worth it or wh- what someone's work is worth to them that kind of 
Yeah. I don't want to get too into it because I think that it's kind of a hot button topic at the moment, um, <laughs> and, including in the podcast sphere. So I don't. <laughs> yeah, I think I think that's just an extension of that yeah. syndrome. Yeah. So what was your pick for your rather be reading this week? Uh, so my rather be reading is um, actually a book I got from the Book of the Month Club called mm. The Last Equation of Isaac Severy by Nova Jacobs, which I chose only because of the fact that it was described as the Westing game for adults, which I love that book as a kid. I think I haven't really read it since I was a kid, but the impression that it left on me, like I have forever since then loved heist novels. Um, See, and, and I generally dislike heist novels and spy novels, which mm. is kind of why this book was a perfect pick for making me hate read. But <laughs> Yeah, no, well, and I'm, I'm only 88 pages into this book, um, and so I don't really know fully where it's going to go yet, but a um, woman named Hazel, her adopted grandfather dies, and he was a famous mathematician. Mm -hmm. And after, and it looks like a um, suicide, but we're led to believe in the prologue of the book that it was, um, someone had come and done a job on him, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, everyone else believes it to have been a suicide, though, but then she gets a letter in the mail that says, you know, you need to destroy this equation that I've created and it's in this place and it basically leads her on kind of a treasure what is it what's the word I'm looking for like a scavenger hunt oh. <laughs> <laughs> leads her on a scavenger hunt to to find this equation and mm. deal with it but it's it's a little bit more literary mm -hmm. As opposed to just kind of fluffy, fun read. So, I don't know. I'm really enjoying it so far. We'll see how it goes. Cool. We'll see if it pays off in out. the end. But yeah. All right. Um, we kind of we kind of went to Rather Be Reading, which is usually one of our later ones in our little segment section here. But mm -hmm. um, what was something you liked about this novel? Oh, God. Um, I liked... <laughs> I don't know. I there wasn't a lot here really that wasn't. appealed to me, and I feel bad saying that. I I, I mean, you know, I know because I know someone does enjoy this book, and yeah. that maybe people who are listening would enjoy this book. It's very easy to read. It's very exciting in some ways. That I think is probably my silver lining is that it was a quick read. Like yeah, it was really fast. I think it, I read it in like three hours. Yeah, it was. It did not take much. I mean, that is really damning with faint praise here that my the best thing I can say about this book is that I didn't have to invest too much time in it but like yeah I mean, it wasn't a trudge like for some for some books. people that actually might be a good you know and I, I'm not mm -hmm. not saying that shadily in any way I'm saying you know like if you're looking for something to read quickly and this is the sort of book that you might like maybe mm -hmm. pick up second honeymoon now that we've entirely spoiled honeymoon for you yeah i think it's like it's the perfect length of book for if you have a long flight or if you have a long layover you're gonna finish this book and then you can leave it in your seat pocket for the next person or something i don't there know there you go yeah so it's not a huge time investment and it passes the time <laughs> 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 what phrase we have what phrase i do have to oh, say man. though like it's some of the, the cliffhangers at the end of the chapters did keep me reading on no. to the next one it no. was i know i no. i was i fell for the trick of like i just want to see where it's going even though i see knew not exactly me i've book was literally doing. every cliffhanger it made me want to throw the book across the room yeah if if i hadn't had to read it for this podcast i would have stopped reading it oh like, absolutely yeah i every cliffhanger i was just like no fuck you you're not tricking me with this again it's <laughs> annoying. Well, it's just, I thought, you know, not everything is as it seems. So maybe this <laughs> is actually going to be really good, even though it seemed really bad. God. <laughs> um, who did you relate to the most? Oh, no one. Maybe, um, mm, maybe the guy that she, that she, so she meets this like younger businessman on the plane. Oh yeah. And he like lies to her about his career because he wanted to seem more impressive because he thought she was cute. Like, I don't know. That's something we've all done. We've all lied to make ourselves look better. And then, <laughs> but then he like fessed up. He fessed up later. He was honest about it. So he wasn't a little skeevy. Um, <laughs> I, I would vote for either Susan or Lizzie. 
Mm. Susan only up into the point where she st- gets back together with John mm-hmm. because yeah, before that, everything before that, you know, she had the good sense to ju- to dump John. So like I can mm-hmm. appreciate that. And then Lizzie murdered Nora, which is, you know, a thing I wanted to do. So, mm-hmm. which I was confused. Like, okay, so when she murdered, when Lizzie murdered Nora, it was implied to be the same way that she murdered the men in her life, that Nora murdered mm-hmm. the men in her life. But like, she didn't How get did she Nora know? to drink that second. Maybe she just poisoned her. Like, maybe it was just that was supposed poison. to be the similarity, mm-hmm. not like full on double shot poison situation i don't know yeah, that, that makes more sense i'm pretty over it yeah i'm never returning to this world of honeymoon and yeah Laura no. and john o'hare ever again so hooray we did it yay it's over <laughs> um all right so you challenged me this fortnight which means it is my turn to challenge you oh, to read a book dear. let me pull it up real quick because i obviously had a long time to think about this since we were on hiatus yes i i found a couple of uh good ones i also yeah i've got i've got my next few planned out <laughs> i'm very excited. um all right so our next book is going to be i i feel like it might be it might be enjoyable for one or both of us maybe i don't know it's just the the oh god okay so we're gonna be reading a dog's purpose no no (laughs) why (laughs) by w bruce cameron no i'm already crying (laughs) (laughs) this is the (laughs) plot of this book This is the remarkable story of one endearing dog search for his purpose over the course of several lives. More than just another charming dog story, this touches on the universal quest for an answer to life's most basic question. Why are we here? Surprised to find himself reborn as a rambunctious golden-haired puppy after a tragically short life as a stray mutt, Bailey's search for his new life's meaning leads him into the loving arms of eight-year-old Ethan, During their countless adventures, Bailey joyously discovers how to be a good dog. But this life as a beloved family pet is not the end of Bailey's journey. Reborn as a puppy yet again, Bailey wonders, will he ever find his purpose? So yeah, basically dog dies a bunch of times. Yeah, a dog keeps getting resurrected and then Dennis Quaid. Like, (laughs) So I'm looking forward to it. I think Man. so trigger warning next episode dead dog <laughs> all over the place <laughs> all over the place <laughs> oh man oh so no. yep that'll be our next read if you guys want to read along you can uh, get that book I think that about wraps it up for this Fortnite's episode as always you guys can follow us on twitter at hate readcast you can also email us hate readcast at gmail.com so go ahead and Email us or tweet at us if you have any suggestions for books we should read or if you happen to be one of James Patterson's many ghostwriters and would like to comment on his stable of ghostwriters. Yeah, please tell us. Or, like, if you've ever ghostwritten in general. I'm very interested in this topic. Yeah. What's it like? Give us all this dirty secrets about... Tell us. Yeah. About Give us famous the authors. And thank you to Ben Cope for the use of our theme song. It's very good. Follow us on iTunes or wherever you guys are getting this podcast. In the words of James Patterson and or Howard Ruffin, here we go, here we go, loop-de-loop, here we go, (laughs) loop-de-loop. I liked the part where the cabbie was like, just what this city needs, huh? Another vigilante on the loose. What? Is this is in this, the Marvel? Is this in Marvel? Universe? Is this like Daredevil running around? Like what's happening? <laughs>